Please be seated. Your Excellency, Sir Rodney Williams, Governor General, and Lady Williams, the Honorable Gaston Brown, Prime Minister, members of cabinet, members of parliament, members of the diplomatic corps, clergy, including Cyril White and members of the White family, ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen a very pleasant, warm, and spirit-filled afternoon is extended to you. I offer words of welcome to all of you to this act of worship, and I hasten to add that words of gratitude are also offered, for our presence here today is an assurance to Sister Cheryl and family that they are not alone in their time of grief. To all of us who grieve now, I say, take heart, for if we grieve faithfully, God's word assures us that we will be comforted. Welcome, and may this act of worship indeed be a blessing to all of our hearts. At this time, we will have the tributes. The tributes will run as printed in our booklets, unannounced. 
And so we invite now representation from Cricket West Indies, Mr. Roland Mopolda, who will be followed by Patrick Brazet, the umpires, the West Indies Cricket Umpires Association, then a tribute from Nice Constance Brown, and then we will hear from, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Honorable Daryl Matthew, Minister of Education and Sports, in that order. Mr. Roland Mopolda. of serving West Indies cricket as an umpire, both at the regional and international level, as well as a match referee during the Stanford year. He umpired international cricket during the period 1983 to 1988, making his debut on April 7, 1983 in Grenada, when the West Indies team played a one-day international against Pakistan. While the final international was here in Antigua in 1988 against India. Pat, as he was affectionately called, started his umpiring career in the 1970s and even after retiring from on-field duties, continued as an umpire trainer in the Leeward Islands. In 2001, he was elected president of the West Indies Cricket Umpires Association and also served on the Cricket West Indies Umpires Committee, which he had the responsibility for umpiring in the region. Pat was meticulous in his work and took great pride in serving the game of cricket. He fought hard to improve umpiring standards and worked with CWI to put systems in place to improve all umpiring across the region. Pat ended his tenure on the Umpires Committee in 2013, having been among the leaders in overseeing the formation of the 12-member CWI Senior Umpires Panel. This panel allowed for umpires to make it through to the international level and for annual umpire retainer contracts be introduced for the members of the panel. Having assisted with putting those systems in place, the region has since then produced three more test umpires and had the pleasure of serving with Pat on this umpires committee. And I also had the not so joyous pleasure of Pat giving me out in a international, in a, sorry, in a regional game playing against Australia at a first class level. No fault of Pat, so I was definitely up. But certainly, on behalf of the Board of Directors and staff of Cricket West Indies, CEO Johnny Grave, who I mentioned earlier, is here with me. I wish to extend sincere condolences to his wife Cheryl, his family, his friends, and hope at their time of bereavement they are able to find comfort knowing that. He was a wonderful servant of the game we love so dear. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your contribution. Established. I bring this word of tribute from Mr. Cecil Fletcher, President of the Cricket West Indies Cricket Umpires Association. 
the late Honourable Patrick Clear Foster White, our dearly departed brother, was a good person, a great man. Whatever he chose to do, he did it to the best of his ability, always. During his life, he gained the distinction of being a first class umpire and match referee, where he performed his duties on and off the field with distinction. Within the WIC cure, he held the office of Area Vice President and then the presidency of this August body, a position he held for many years with distinction. He was well respected by all, a cool operator, where, with consummate ease, he discharged the duties of the association professionally. When he announced at a point in time This showed the measure of the man and the high regard and respect he was given. Patrick and I served on the then West Indies Cricket Board Umpires Subcommittee for a few years. He was my great mentor. His participation at the WICU conventions benefited all attendees. He was always to the point on substantive issues and his departure will surely create a void. To his dear wife Cheryl, son John, the extended family, friends and all those who grieve, I sincerely extend condolence on behalf of the executive and members of the West Indies Cricket Umpires Association. May his soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine upon him. Cecil Fletcher. with his extended family 
and on special occasions, it was good to chat with him. Whether it was 20 minutes or an hour, it was satisfying for me and I hope for him also. The funny thing is that if on any of these celebratory dates I should call him before he had a chance to call me, he would say, you beat me to it. But those words always made me so proud. You see, he was a man of few words that said a lot. Whenever he visited me or I came back to Antigua, we would catch up on family news, who was in high school, who was getting married, was my daughter still in the military? He wanted details and progress of all his nieces and nephews. He would even give my husband a separate little moment where they would go deep into cricket. He was not a man of false concerns. If you asked him, if he asked you, it was his nature. My uncle was a man of profound honesty, a man of self-sacrifice, a man of uncompromising standards, but a humble man. Personally, he was a constant shoulder for me to lean on over the years, bearing several roles, uncle, big brother, friend, confidant. When my father passed, he was there for us, his brother's children, helping us through our grief, remain in us. Rest in heaven, angel. Honorable Sir Rodney Williams, Governor General of Antigua and Barbuda, and Lady Williams. Honorable Gaston Brown, Prime Minister, and other members of the Cabinet, members of Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the media, but I think most appropriately today, members of the family of the late giant, Mr. Pat White, good afternoon. If you permit me to commence my very brief remarks this afternoon with a poem, I dare say a favorite poem of mine, and it goes, do not stand at my grave and weep. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow, and the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain, and the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circle flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Good afternoon again, everyone. We have assembled this afternoon to say farewell to a true son and patriot of Antigua and Barbuda. And in preparing this tribute, reflected on the famous quote, every man's life ends the same way. It is only the details of how he lived and how he died that distinguish one man from another. I'm convinced that the legend, the legend we are celebrating today, Mr. Pat White, has distinguished himself from many of his peers and contemporaries over many, many years. His accomplishments can be described as gargantuan, visionary, and even revolutionary. Mr. White's vision played a major role in the development and recognition of scores of athletes in Antigua and Barbuda. In fact, perhaps the greatest manifestation of his sporting genius was the role he played in introducing to the world Sir Vivian Richards. Let that sink in for a moment. Mr. Patrick Clear Foster White, a man of small stature, from a small community, in a small country, somehow managed to overcome the challenges of his generation and impacted the trajectory of the world through sports simply by doing what he loved. How 
can the dead be truly dead when they still live in our souls and the souls of all who are left behind? Our former director of sports epitomized the famous quote, all the world is a stage and all the men and women are merely players. His stage was the sporting arena and the players were the athletes, coaches and administrators. His life's work in sports is a testimony to his deep understanding of the mind, body and soul of an athlete. In an era when there was very little to play for, except for pride, he understood love is ever lost and he was loved so much. May the soul of Mr. Patrick Clear Foster White and the souls of the faithfully departed rest in eternal peace and rise in everlasting glory. Thank you. Considering the circumstances, I trust that you will permit me to adopt and observe the protocols as previously established. But I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the presence of His Excellency Sir Rodney Williams in his official capacity as Governor General, but also in his personal capacity as a, a dear friend to the departed whom he also referred to as Uncle Pat. And I'd like to acknowledge the Prime Minister Honorable Gaston Brown, the members of Cabinet, and the members of the, sp the sporting fraternity that my father would have daily loved. I think I've seen this day in my mind, different versions of it, for a while now since Mr. White started to slow down a bit. And I, also, I always wondered who would be the brave soul or the fool that would try to come up here and eulogize the great man. And so, now that I've been given that responsibility, the scale or the magnitude of the moment isn't lost on me. And so I'll try to use some of his own words, some of the words of his closest friends and colleagues and former workmates, and the words of my mother, Cheryl, his wife, who has been to the good, the bad, and the, the painful and the scary with him these last 30 plus years. And I'll add my own little pieces to it. We definitely wouldn't want to columnicize the story of Pat White or give the impression that his story began with us in power. Far from it. As was mentioned in some of the tributes, my father was born in 1945, January 13th, and in his words, he came from over the gutter at Dickinson Bay Street. Very humble beginnings, and he would have been proud of what he accomplished. Being born to a Christian mission, Olive Alberta White, and a baker, Albert White. And he spoke fondly of his childhood, he spoke fondly of the time he spent vacationing by the Tullys and hiding from the cart when it used to come around at night. And because he was the baby of the family, the last child for his parents, he got to tag along with his, his big brother, Uncle Jay, um, Sidney Pooh, and his big sister, Cynthia, who would take him to Dredgeby to catch shrimp, or swims, as they call them. And he shared memories of his time at the Point Government School, Princess Margaret Secondary School, where he did business, and I think that's where he developed a love for sports. Now he spent some time in other careers when he just started out, um, and that will be detailed in the funeral brochure, the, the bulletin that you have. I hope you all get a chance to read the biography. But obviously his true love was sports. And he talked about his short career in football that lasted one day, 
he played against a team and he remembers it that was called the Spartans. And he gave the example of one of the Spartans that his name was Skem. And Skem eventually became a butcher. But at the time, Skem weighed about 200 pounds. And my father remembered that he was a little scrawny, 120 pound man. And his recollection is that in his first game, first time Skem came down the line, he went in and cut down Skem with a tackle. And the two of them went down. And as far as Pat Wright said, when Skem eventually got up, off of him, and he came to, he decided that football was not for him. <laughs> but he spent the rest of his, his sporting career playing cricket. He eventually became the captain of the Villa Parish League team. And then he, he focused on administration, which was his real skill, which was his real strength. So fast forward to 1973, when he joined the sports division at the newly, well, the newly created sports division at the Ministry of Education. And he would have spent the next 20 years working with Danny Livingston and Sir Reg Samuel and putting in the work, paying his dues, cutting the kasi, and not cutting the kasi as we say colloquially or, or figuratively, but literally cutting the kasi. Um, as a lot of the persons that call or message me or, or stop me and share stories talk about seeing Pat White on his own with a cutlass and a roller and his oil paint trying to prepare someone on the fields for a cricket or football match. And he took that job seriously. He would have spent his 12 and 13 and 14 hour days being as organized and meticulous as you've heard him described in some of the tributes. And it was the pride of his life to be able to touch so many young footballers and cricketers, many of who are in the audience, and many of who are around the, the country and the regional diaspora. And by the time I would have come along, by the late 80s, and he would become director of sports in the early 90s, he was already a seasoned veteran and a legend in his field. So, when I hear some of the tributes and some of the, um, his former co-workers talk about how meticulous and organized he was at work. I smile because it was the same pathway that we got at home. I was watching the documentary prepared by Jack Matthew and his team at ABS last night. Wonderful production considering the amount of time that they had to pull it together. And I heard Emma, uh, Mervyn Richards, mention that when they used to go on trips with Mr. White as manager, and you'd go into his room, he would have every single piece of clothing and all the socks and all the jerseys well laid out and well organized. And I've heard the same story from Jojo, and I'd heard it from my uncle, the late um, Barbara Ferrance, who used to say the same thing, that Mr. White's room was always organized. And that is nothing new to me, because that's exactly how his room is organized at home. Every shirt, every pair of pants in his right. I don't think people realize is that Pat White also would take off his used clothing and fold them up before putting them into the laundry. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. He'd take off the shirt that he's wearing, button it back up, fold it up, and then put it in the hamper. So you can imagine that used to drive my mother crazy when it was time to do the laundry. But that was Mr. White at home. He would have the shoes lined up perfectly. Each one would get polished with the side of the brush that he wrote on polish. And then the other side of the brush, he would write shine. And so when they dried, he would go and shine them. And imagine being a, a teenage boy trying to live up to that sort of standard and just picking up the brush and using the shine part with polish on it and we would have fire and brimstone in the house because you cannot move Mr. White's thing out of its rightful place. But that was my father. And he was level-headed. He was organized, he was level-headed, he was honest, fair, and he tried to always abide by the rules, even when nobody was looking. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, uh, opportunity to apologize to anybody that would have been 
driving down factory road anytime between the years uh, around 2000, 2010, when you would have been slowed down and you thought it was a traffic jam or a police, police stop or something like that. It was Pat White driving 25 miles per hour with 10 cars behind him blowing their arms and he did not care because he was not going to break the speed limit. So when I'm in the vehicle with him hiding and covering my face and saying, Dad, you're going to speed up a little bit, Jack. He would say, you want to drive this? Let them drive this and I drive. Let them drive their cars, I will drive mine. And he would put his hand out the window and I assume he was signaling to them to go around or fly over. But he was not going to break the rules of the Antigua and Barbara Transport Board for anybody. And that's how he operated all throughout his career, his umpiring life. He was always trying to be honest and fair and follow the rules. And one, one thing I think you would all know about him is that he was an orator. He was a talker. He was a narrator, a commentator. And I would call him a teacher as much as he was an administrator because he loved to pass on knowledge. He used to have a, a show on ABS radio called Know the Game. And in the football season, he would be on, you know, explaining the regulations and rules of football, the cricket season. He would be explaining the laws of cricket. And then carnival season, he would be giving me the laws of the household and letting me know how late I can come into the house before I meet the front door a lot. But that's a story for a different time. And I'm, I'm sure if you did a poll, if you took a poll of all the gentlemen here, all the athletes around, each person could give you some story, some life lesson, um, some lecture, some anecdote that they received from Mr. White that benefited them. And me and my friends were no different. They would come over and they would end up getting some sort of advice or lecture from him. And if you can imagine what I had to put up with getting multiple of those lectures every single day for 30 something years. Anybody feel sorry for me as yet? <laughs> but he took it all in stride. He understood what his burden was to bear. Um, he used to find it strange when people would come up to him and as he put it, somebody's coming up to him with grey beard, grey hair and saying, well, Pat White, since I was a little boy, I saw you on TV and you were coming to my school. And he used to come home and say, well, if he had grey beard and he's over 50, and he remember me when he was a little boy, then why Pat White must be old as the hills. <laughs> and again, so when persons would have seen the firm, strict administrator, you know, the, the school principal type character, I would have seen that side of him, but also got an opportunity to see the softer, more sensitive, even silly side. So if you can imagine Mr. White, who's always in his suit and tie, coming home and taking off his suit and then moonwalking through the house, singing in a high-pitched voice, singing some old calypso from the bummer or Sparrow or some one of them, and trying to do all the short shirt dances. He used to say that he can't dance like short shirt the way MR could, but he would still try. And that was the side of him that many people didn't get to see, but I can appreciate when he let his guard down. But back to his sports career, the one thing that Mr. White was proud of, one thing that he considered his baby was the Antigua Recreation Grounds. And I had to take a back seat. He reminded me that on the day that I was born, April 15, 1986, that's the same day that survey would have hit the fastest test century at the time, in I think 51 or 52 balls. And that happened at the ARG. So he reminded me all the time that my birth was the second best thing that happened on that day. And I will accept second place to nobody other than survey. But listen, he spoke with pride. I've heard this mentioned on all the different radio shows and all the different interviews that the pride that he had at the opportunity to get the ARG ready for that first series. It wasn't the first series, but it was a test series in 1998, England versus West Indies. And against all odds, when people said it couldn't be done, when the international press was expecting a catastrophe, 
when they used to shout from the stands, Pat Twitty, I can't do anything. He was always confident that because of the team he had around him, the team that stood with him, he used to talk about Mr. Roberts, Everett Roberts of Roberts Construction and Mr. Purcell and the Public Works team. And then you had the staff from Recreation Grounds that would say, once Mr. White is staying late, we're staying late. We're talking about Color, I think his real name was Ickford, Thomas, and Mabel, and Cruz, and Roma, people that I considered superheroes because of the way my father spoke about them. And what he felt most motivated by was the fact that regular members of the public, we would go, me and my mother would go with him some of the nights and just sit in the stands and watch the guys working, digging up the field, doing what they had to do. And before, when you looked around, you just see random persons from the public coming and sitting with us and just cheering on the team that was out there working, trying to get that ground ready. And when it was done, when it was all done, he always reminded everybody that it wasn't just him, it was a team effort. And I think it was a landmark moment for the country and for the West Indies overall. And similarly, um, as Minister Matthew alluded to, he was extremely proud of the National Sports Awards. And I, I had touched on it when he, he gave the address, but one thing that stood out to me after I heard the documentary last night again was how keen he was on ensuring that the persons who are unsung athletes in sports that don't usually get the highlights, the persons in domino and draft and some of these sort of hidden sports, he would drive around and go to each one of the nominees and prep them and coach them for their moment, their five minutes in the spotlight that they would get to be on TV on the big stage. And he felt most proud of getting some of those people who would otherwise never be seen to get their moment in the sun. That's the kind of person that he was. And if he had a love, a true love in sports, it would have been umpiring. Pat White loved umpiring. And based on some of the tributes that you'll see from fraternity in the, the same funeral program, and based on the number of international umpires that have come here, as you can see to pay tribute, umpiring love, Pat White. And it's true that he never got a chance to stand in a test match. And I wouldn't attempt to even discuss the, the, the sort of politics that would have caused that. I think somebody like Hugo would be better suited for that than I am. But what I can say is whether it was small island politics or versus big island politics or ALP versus UPP politics, Mr. White just wanted to work. Whoever was in front of him, whatever his task was, he would get up every day and go to work, training whoever he had to train, supporting whoever he had to support. And he eventually became the Antigua Barbuda Cricket Umpires Association president, and then the Leeward Islands Cricket Umpires Association, Association president, you say that properly, Cricket Umpires Association president. And then in 2001, he would have been voted in as the president of the West Indies Cricket Umpires Association. And he ran again in 2003 and won. And I think I was just becoming, I was just becoming an adult at that time. And he, he always said he wasn't going to run again in 2005 because he wanted, one, to give the younger umpires a chance to lead. But then he always used to say, no make nobody push you out to anything. Do not allow them to say that Michael should have left a long time. So in the year 2005, I remember him discussing with my mother that he was not going to run again. But somehow when he went to the convention, they convinced him to take it on for another year. And then he said that would definitely be another two years. And he definitely said that would definitely be his last um, stint. And he left it in 2005. If, if, or 2007, if I'm not mistaken. And on that same note, he would have retired from the government service just around 2004, again insisting that it was time for him to turn it over to the team, whether it was the National Sports Award, whether it was the ARG, he felt it was time for new blood to take over. And he took a long break for about a day or two before he was convinced by Sir Andy 
Roberts, who encouraged him to take up the post as the manager of the Sticky Wicket. I shouldn't say Sticky Wicket, it's a Stanford Cricket Ground. And he did that for a couple of years before he fully retired from paid service. And I say paid service because his life work continued. He, was, he had such a wealth of knowledge that persons would, would ask him to join different committees and different boards as an advisor or a consultant. And persons just in general, whether you were at the rest, a restaurant, the airport, wherever he would be, there was somebody that would come and sit down and say, Pat White, what Western is doing? Mr. White, where do you think they're supposed to drop? And as soon as anybody would say that, for the next two hours, it's Pat White talking about every single thing that should have happened in West Indies cricket. <laughs> and he had the knowledge. I mean, I guess he had to do something with it because people need to appreciate that the internet wasn't what it was or what it is now. It wasn't that then. So Pat White used to sit and read every single cricket newspaper, cricket magazine. He used to memorize the record books and could tell you who had the most wickets on a Tuesday in 1985 in Australia. He would sit and watch every single cricket match, every single one, sometimes multiple times, on Willow Cricket or Sports Max. And he used to drive me crazy because I'm asking, Daddy, what can you get from a black and white 1978 match between Pakistan and India? What can you learn from that? And he wouldn't look up at me. He said, every time you watch, you learn something new. And he was so dedicated to learning the craft and continuously evolving and growing that he just would not stop trying to find new ways to gather new information. I wouldn't want to leave and make it seem like Mr. White was one-dimensional and, and sports were the only way that he could um, express himself. He was a church man. This church, to be exact, he used to visit at 6.15 in the morning and have my dear mother in tow. So you can imagine what time they had to wake up and leave Parham to get here driving 25 miles per hour. <laughs> but he was committed. He was committed and he eventually became a part of the short-term fundraising committee and was, in my mind, more determined to raise funds to get this edifice back to what it was than the deans themselves. And he worked along closely with them on the, the, you know, the different banquets and the cocktails. I remember he worked closely with Dean Smithen, Smithen, I believe, on the Saturday morning flea markets where he would again wake up early in the morning. He was always up by five o'clock anyway, but then he would be going to the flea markets to try to raise funds. So he was committed to his, to, to his church and to his God. And towards the end, he became much more spiritual. Uh, my mother used to, to enjoy the devotions that they would have. And... <laughs> When he would, he started praying out loud. And the same Pat White that you would hear as a commentator with certain profound conversations, that's the same way he spoke to his maker. And when he felt like one of his prayers touched on all the cornerstones that he needed to touch on, she said he would open his eyes and say, the lyrics boy? <laughs> and that was the man, competitive even in the vein of, of speaking to his God. And as he got ill towards the end, and I'm, I'm saying ill because the giant of a man that people talk about, that was Pat White, the minute that he couldn't walk around or run around Parham and do 100 sit-ups and then 105 and then 120 and he could only do 90, he considered his body to be a failure. He was so competitive even with himself where he would cut the grass and it's that determined, okay, I did it in two hours last week, I have to do it in one hour and 59 minutes this week. And when we all started to appreciate that, you know, as life comes and you get older, his body would start to deceive him. And even while his mind was still sharp, you could see the frustration in the man when he had to depend on people, whether me, whether my mother, whether uncles, whether families, relatives, 
to do things that he used to feel tried doing on his own. And it gave us an opportunity. It was difficult at times, but it gave us an opportunity to have these man-to-man, -man, heart to heart conversations about life and about the realistic aspects of, of getting older. And he got very comfortable with stating that, you know, he's a warrior. He's, he wants to go out on the battlefield with his sword in his hand. So even if I have to help him out on the street and he can walk, go out and then collapse in the street, then people will say, okay, Pat White fell down, walking in the street, and that's when he went, as opposed to just laying in a bed, you know, with, with nurses trying to help him. But we were determined to have him extend his life as much as he could. He said that he would have outlived his useful life because he got his three score and ten. But for the sake of his, his children and his grandchildren, we wanted him to be around for as long as possible. And I have to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge all the doctors, Dr. Belazir, Dr. Osborne, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Stevens Gordon, Dr. Courtney Lewis, that would have checked in, called, checked on him, dealt with him at appointments. I have to acknowledge uh, Mrs. Panton and Sister Mary as well, who would have worked with him very closely in those last few months. And Nurse Williams at the Bishop John Knight Golden Age Home. These are persons that looked out for him, not because they knew he was Pat White, but just because they, they saw what he stood for, they saw how much he loved and appreciated his family, and they all took a, a liking to him. Now I'll mention, while they took a liking to him, they all took a beating too, because Pat White had to be in charge, just as much as he was in life, towards his death. So when anybody, any of us, would tell him when he needs to eat, he would let them know, no, he's not ready as yet. Come back in half an hour. And no matter what you insist, he would look at us or the nurse and he said, I said no. N-O. You understand how that spell? And we all just understood that that's the persona, that's the stature of the man. As long as he had life, as long as he had breath, he was going to be in charge. And so, as I close off, I want to make it clear that the, the warmth or the, the peace that we would have had in this last few days or a few weeks, we would have had the help of Miss Valerie Gonzalez Barrero who walked us through the process, Miss Cabral and the team at Foreign Affairs, and I also want to give thanks to Mr. Stevens and the Cricket Umpires Association, and Antigua Barbie Cricket Umpires Association, for making representation to Cabinet for this official funeral, and also thank the Cabinet of Antigua and Barbuda for bestowing this honor on my father. But we would have gotten a certain amount of peace. One, because we said all that we had to say to Mr. White, and he said all that he had to say to us. But I'll share this last story that when the nurse who was with him at his passing called and she said, Look, you need to come fast because I think Mr. White is transitioning. And she said that he was being fed and he stopped and said to the nurse at the time, wait, I can see a light. And she said the nurse believed, okay, well maybe the sun is in his face or one of the lights is in his face. So the nurse would have gotten up and shifted and stood in front of him and said, Okay, Mr. White, is this better? And he looked at her and said, No, I can still see a light. And he bowed his head. Now what I picture is whether the ultimate umpire would have signaled out or not. The batsman decided that it was time for him to walk and he would have removed his gloves and tucked his bat under his arm and headed back towards the players pavilion his way on his terms with a brilliant knock of 77 what a moment of West Indian joy would you agree may his soul rest in peace
thank you for sharing the tribute to the eulogy with us. And now we are invited to stand and sing the hymn, How Christians Join to Sing. How Christians Join to Sing. <laughs> reading from the Word of God, written in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 3, reading from verses 1 through 5 and verse 9. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster and they are going from us to be their destruction, but they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he watches over his elect. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.
Good afternoon, church. A reading taken from the Word of God, written in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6, and verse 27. I'm trying to catch my breath. The reading is taken from the New Revised International Version and reads as follows Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you. May peace, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be free. Word of the Lord. I know not why God's wonderful spirits to me to have the glory. Assemble here 
this afternoon. We give you thanks and praise for the life of our brother Pat and for the invaluable contribution that he has made to nation building. We pray at this time for the, his family, his dear wife, and children, and other relatives. We ask, so God, that you may comfort them in this year time of bereavement. Give them strength. Fill them with hope and guide them through the day of service of others. So may his family give of themselves in building up others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In expressing condolences to Mrs. White and members of the White's family on the death of Pat, Permit me to borrow the sentiments of one Sir Aurobindo, who says, and I quote, Never forget that you are not alone. The divine is with you, helping and guiding. He is a companion who never fails, the friend whose love comforts and strengthens. Have faith and he will do everything for you. Let me on behalf of the members of the Cathedral Parish, the office staff, the Dean and the, the Dean and clergy and their families, and on behalf of my family and myself, express our sympathies to you as you mourn the death of Pat. It is our prayer that God will continue to comfort, strengthen, and uphold you during your bereavement. Please be assured of our prayers and the prayers of the church as you mourn our brother's death. My text is in two parts. And the first is from the book of Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 1 to 5, it reads, Moses, the servant of God, went up from the plains of Moab unto Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah and died there. And the second is from the poem, The Wine Cup. It says, death will come to all men soon or late. Moses led the people of Israel for 40 years. But he had the energy at that time of his death to climb to Mount Nebo, to the rugged top of Pisgah, to die. How strange, but yet how fascinating. Life for him was not always easy going, in fact, his journey from birth to death was inundated with numerous and perilous trials. Though he faced the constant murmurs and antagonism of a rebellious people, he never flinched, but like a brave soldier, he stuck to the task assigned, relying not so much on his own strength, but on the guidance and inspiration of God Almighty who called him into service. Moses was a man of his time, who put service before self, a man of enduring patience and faith. And though the journey was rough and the storms of life boisterous, he completed the mission to which he was assigned. Now the end of his earthly pilgrimage was summoned to Mount Pisgah, where his body was laid to rest. Surely the testimony of St. Paul the Apostle 
could readily be attributed to him. For yes, he finished the race. He remained faithful all the way. Now the time had come for him to rest from his labors. It's a time that will be for all of us. And as you see it, it is a time to part, whom we memorialize today. Pat may not be a Moses. He led no nation, group, or community through the wilderness. But like Moses, he left an indelible mark on this nation, especially the sporting fraternity. He made an impress on our beloved nation that no recent or future experiences could erase. His record has been engraved in the minds and hearts of many. We have heard from numerous persons of his accolades, his momentous accomplishments, his unselfish, generous service. We heard of lives he touched, persons he encouraged and motivated, but he was also a man of faith, an ardent believer and devoted man of God who loved this church and our Lord Jesus Christ. To ensure that effective repairs were done to this beautiful edifice, the cathedral church, packed with several other members under the chair of Mrs. Heather Bailey, worked tirelessly week after week, selling goods to raise funds. I recall the several Saturday mornings at about four o'clock. We spent packing vehicles with items for sale at Judgment Square. Let me again express gratitude to Pat and all members of the committee and their spouses for their support. Mrs. White was a chauffeur for Pat and she ensured that he was punctual. Thank you, Mrs. White. Pat's name may not be engraved in some plaque at the Antigua Re Recreation Ground, or he may not be knight receive a knighthood, as some suggest, but surely he has a reward far greater and more lasting than any earthly gain or reward. He is now in the presence of God, whom he served faithfully, and he balanced the time spent in sports with the time in worship of the Lord God who supplied his needs daily. He will be greatly missed. But Solomon the wise reminds us, as you have heard in the first lesson read this afternoon, the soul of the righteous are in the hands of God and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster, and they are going from us to be their destruction, for they are at peace. Wisdom of Solomon 3, 1 to 3. Yes, our beloved part is at peace, a peace that not attained through treaties, but by experiencing and following our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. For more than a generation, Moses had been on the road leading God's people. And he did so with fine tenacity, through good report and evil report. Through a thousand delays and discouragement, however, he observed a steadfast refusal to give will ever remember, be remembered by all of us. Even when the odds were against him, he persevered. And this describes the metal of which he was made. He never allowed the noise of detractors to alter his course or foil his plans. He set his moral compass and he allowed Yahweh his God to guide him in all his endeavors. Mahatma Gandhi once said, 
Strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from the indomitable will. In countless lives, the full measure of completeness is really granted in this world. There are always limitations of circumstances or of endowment or of life itself. Sometimes our own efforts are retarded by friends who rather than assist in the pursuance of our dreams attempt in every way to dissuade us. Sometimes the powers that be for political and other reasons implant stumbling blocks along your path to the attainment of success and sometimes even families dishearten us and there are occasions when our will to press forward and upward are affected by our own frustrations but achievements must be measured by how we are able to manage the ship of life during the storms while teaching and inspiring others to fill each hour with 60 minutes of devoted service while implanting the footprints in the sands of time. Our friend and brother Pat has weathered numerous storms and survived. But there is one storm, if I should describe it as a storm, that neither Moses, Pat, nor any one of us could survive, and that is death. Norman Hutton, who was chaplain of the University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff, and the priest wrote, and I quote, Each one of us has to die. Oh yes, we may shrink from it. We may want to be sheltered from all thought of it. We may dislike talking about it. We may resolve to play games of make-believe, but escape it we can never. Try as we may to forget the fact of death cannot be forgotten. Deny it as we may, death itself remains undeniable. Any of us may die at any time, but all of us must die sometime. The circumstances which will surround our deaths, the manner of our dying, the time of our dying, the scene of our dying are for all of us uncertain and unpredictable. But the fact that we shall, the fact is, we shall die, and this is absolutely certain. In the words of George Bernard Shaw, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. At a funeral in one of my parishes in Northern Ireland, I reminded the leaders of that country of an important fact of life and the biblical it is destined that each person dies only once and after that comes judgment Hebrews 9.27 I further reminded them individually naming them by the office they held not by their names that death is no respecter of persons and that all and sundry will die for doing so I was described by some as being disrespectful. But my brothers and sisters, I don't mean, I don't mind being disrespectful in speaking the truth and stating the facts about life. I do not mind being disrespectful in proclaiming the truth of the gospel. I couldn't care less for being disrespectful in challenging people regardless of status or the importance of preparation for death. You know, preparations are made for our entering into this world. But how many make preparation for their departure? So I will be disrespectful again this afternoon in saying, Your Honor, the Governor, 
you're going to die someday. Honorable Prime Minister, you too will experience death. So to other members of the cabinet and all politicians, my brother Dean and Father Roberts, we are all, as clergy, will experience death. So to are all present here this afternoon. People of our beloved nation, sometime, someplace, somewhere, we will all die. So I challenge all of us to put our houses in order. I challenge all of us to ensure that our traveling bags are packed with the basic necessities for this journey. The prophet Micah tells us, and I quote, God wants his people to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. Micah 6.8 My brothers and sisters, humankind is mortal. We live to die. Death is all part of the ongoing experience of life. And the evidence is visible before our very eyes. The casket containing the mortal remains of one we love lies in the aisle as a signal to all of us of the certainty of death. But my brothers and sisters, death does not have the last word. It is not our savior. It can only do what death does. That is, take our breath away leaving our bodies void of life as we know it. But there is a life that death cannot erase. It's a life that is not defined by possessions, by status, by rank, or eminence. The rich farmer in the parable recorded in St. Luke's Gospel felt so. He made preparations, impactful preparations for the here and now but failed miserably in that he did not prepare for the hereafter the life to come Jesus concluded this parable with some invaluable and instructive information that all of us should adhere to he says a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not relationship with God. Luke 12, 21. Life for the believer is knowing God, having a wonderful relationship with Him who is the giver of life. Moses had no great possessions, but he knew God, who led him up the Mount of Pisgah, took him to himself, and endowed in him, endowed him with eternal life. Pat also had no great possessions. He had love. The love of God and the love of his fellow men. God, we may say, took him to himself and gave him the true life. Jesus, who has power over life and death, assures all believers that even though they die, like everyone else, we live again. Yet given he had given eternal life. And this eternal life cannot be taken away by death. And so our brother Pat, rest in peace. You have earned your rest and overcame death by find, finding God in it. Goodbye, my brother, until we meet again. And may your soul and the souls of the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace and some they rise in glory. Amen.
now stand and we recite the words of the Apostle of the Spirit. resurrection and I am life. Lord, you console Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Patrick White and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raised the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal intent. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Yes, our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Yes, he was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Yes, Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother Patrick the Foster, who was born by water and the spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his death may call to us your victory over us and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow you to our living room and may the living reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of the ages. Amen. We are invited to stand as we have the commendation. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. We are sorrow and pain and no more, more neither the sign, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind. And we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. We are sorrow and pain and no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Let us commend our brother Patrick Cleofaster to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. 
deliver your servant, Patrick Cleofosta, O Sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set him free from every bond, that he may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We pray now as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, as your name is gospel. Into your hands, O oh merciful Saviour, we commend your servant Patrick Cleofaster. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and giving life to those in the tomb. Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. The Lord will guide our feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to all who believe in his name, saying, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Into paradise. Into paradise may the angels, angels lead you. At your, your coming, may the martyrs receive you and bring you into the holy city, Jerusalem. Amen. We now sing the recessional hymn, To God Be the Glory. <laughs> 